Well, hello, boys and girls, people of all ages. Welcome to the show. One thing I've been thinking about recently is um, this idea of, are there certain ages when people tend to join Jehovah's Witnesses? And on the flip side of that coin, are there certain ages when people tend to leave Jehovah's Witnesses? And uh, I have some ideas, so I'm going to talk about them and then I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. I think one thing that originally got me thinking about this was learning about Eric Erickson's stages of psychosocial development, which is a model you see a lot talked about in um, psychology. And so for me, uh, it was always kind of a love-hate relationship, Erickson's developmental stages, because as I read through them, they really ring true. It's, he seems to really have nailed what's going on with most people's lives at certain time periods. And at the same point, <laughs> I hate them because um, sometimes I'm reading them like, man, I'm, I, I'm, I still need to work on things that he's tying into things that teenagers are, are resolving. And here I am 47 years old, still need to work on that. So but uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I remember especially waking up and then leaving the organization. I had so much anger and uh, uh, definitely a lot of it was uh, directed externally at the organization and, and uh, you know, my parents even for getting into the organization. But interestingly, I definitely had a lot of anger at internally toward myself and just the, all this um, narrative about, man, how could you have been so stupid to not see through this organization and, and to s stay in it so long. What a dummy you must be. All that kind of uh, negative self-talk. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things, uh, I think I've heard it said, when you know more, you, you do more. Or when you know better, you do better. And we were just doing the best we could with the hand we were given, with the information that we had at the time, which is, you know, provided all by Jehovah's Witnesses and the organization. We were being the best humans we could be with that information that we had at the time. And now that we know more, um, now we can do better. And uh, it's kind of like the thinking along the, with the Good Samaritan laws that exist where you can't sue bystanders who try and help out at an accident. Um, they can just do what they can do. You can't you can't blame a, a bystander and say, hey, you should have done emergency surgery on me uh, to help me. If they don't know how to do the surgery, you know, they can't do the surgery. So, yeah, I think it's just one of those things you have to, we have to cut ourselves a little slack sometimes and give ourselves a little grace that, hey, that earlier me, they were doing the best they can, the best they could with what they knew at the time. Now we know more, and now we can do better. So that's my thoughts on that. Okay, so the first age I really kind of um, notice is the late teens as a time when um, people, a lot of people have joined Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and Erickson, in his model, he defines this stage as the central conflict is identity versus confusion. And so the sense of um, trying to develop, find out who you are. And so you see teenagers always, uh, you know, trying out crazy hairstyles and wacky clothing choices. Um, and a lot of times the parents are super alarmed about, oh my goodness, they're, what are they turning into? They're going down this path where they're going to end up selling crack on the street corner. And, uh, and yeah, a lot, most of the time it's not where they're going down a certain trajectory. They're just, they're going to try this out for a little while and get a feel for it. And then they're going to jump over to this thing and try it out for a little while. And so just trying out all these different, um, things, different identities to try and find, well, what is my identity and, uh, who am I exactly? And the things kind of, you generally kind of coalesce after those, that time period and, settle into a, a, you know, a fairly normal um, situation for for young adults. And certainly for Jehovah's Witness kids, uh, this is super complicated because 
Um, there's so much, so many constraints put on what kind of person you can be as a witness. I mean, really, there's only one personality that you're supposed to have as a witness, the new personality. And so any attempts by teenagers to try out different um, identities is super complicated for um, witness teens. Now, the interesting thing that I've noticed is that the uh, really powerful convictions can be formed as a teenager. And so while a person may be young at that point, they can develop really deep, really meaningful um, philosophies and beliefs that can uh, drive them and influence them for the rest of their lives and can you know, uh, attract other people too uh, as they see those, the strength of those beliefs. I think we forget sometimes how young the founders of various religions were. You know, when we think of Charles Taze Russell uh, and the Bible students, you always picture him as that kindly grandpa with the big bushy gray beard. And I think we forget sometimes Charles Russell, he was an 18-year-old uh, boy, 18-year-old teen when he started that Bible study group with his dad and a few friends there. And now here we are, um, a religion with 8 million members. Uh, the same way with Joseph Smith, the founder of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. He was uh, having visions, say, from 15 to 18 years old. And that was the, the very start of Mormonism. Uh, Ellen White, the founder, one of the co-founders of Seventh-day Adventism, same way. She was having visions of uh, at around 17 years old. And now here she is... Um, and Seventh-day Adventism, a religion with, say, maybe 15 to 20 million members around the world now. Uh, Joan of Arc, she started having her visions around 13 years old, and she had been executed by the time she was 19. So her entire scope of her life occurred uh, during those teenage years and left a real mark on uh, history. I'll put a plug in here just randomly for the History on Fire podcast was one I listened to a lot uh, a couple years back because, uh, uh, I don't know, at least for me, I never really learned much about world history as as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so that podcast is really good. He'll, he'll go like multiple hours talking about Joan of Arc, for example, in France. And um, I really learned a lot from, from those podcasts. So yeah, that's the situation historically. And I mean, certainly too, as we look at, even at the governing body today, we see similar uh, situations. So some of the guys in the governing body were raised as witnesses or came to it later in life. But you got uh, guys like Kenneth Cook who converted in high school. Um, so 17, 18 years old. Uh, Garrett Loesch, came in around 18 years old or so. So, And now here they are on the governing body running the religion. So that's the first major age point that kind of jumped out at me. The next one I, I kind of picture a lot is somewhere around 30 years old, give or take. Um, and even, <laughs> even depending how literally you want to take the Bible, uh, you think about how old Jesus was when he started his ministry. Uh, right at 30 years old. So that is kind of interesting. But what really made me start thinking about it was um, I was reading this book, uh, Transitions, by William Bridges. Uh, I'm still reading it. It seems pretty good so far, talking about, you know, shifting points in your life. But uh, there's one point he's talking about, because he was doing seminars about helping people handle transitions in their life. And he, he noted that a lot of people either seem to take one of two tracks younger in life. Either they figure out really early what they want to do with their life and go down that course, or they might be ones who bounce around and try a lot of different things, trying to kind of feel out their place in life and figure out what they want to do. Um, but he writes, he says, both groups tend to find themselves asking these questions as they approach 30. Levinson calls this time the age 30 transition. Gould emphasizes a growing realism about oneself and calls it a time of opening up to what's inside. Either way, the approaching 30th birthday seems to inspire second thoughts. This can be the pivotal transitional point in a lifetime. Whatever it was that people were doing before begins to seem not quite right. 
About a third of the participants in that first transition seminar were within two or three years of 30. And even though they had initially failed to see what else they had in common, they were struck with this coincidence. So yeah, when I read that, that really struck me um, thinking about my own life because I was about 30, 32 uh, when I finally made the move to uh, quit being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And that was really striking that the book had called out that age time frame as a time when many people, I mean, there's nothing about witnesses or even religious stuff in this book. It's just talking about people reevaluating their marriages or their career path that they've chosen so far, that kind of thing. But uh, 30-ish is kind of a major turning point for a lot of people as they're thinking about what they've done so far with their life. Now, then he went on to make another statement that jumped out at me. He says, it can also be a very lonely time because the very people that one would normally talk to about personal problems may be the people that one is having second thoughts about. And so again, he's, he's primarily talking about, you know, if you're in a marriage and kind of rethinking that relationship, but how true is that for Jehovah's Witnesses? Because if you're starting to rethink your um, religious philosophies uh, and maybe exiting the religion, and yet everybody that is surrounding you is in the religion, is a witness, and that leaves you really with nobody to talk to, and that can be really challenging. And finally, he made one, a third really interesting point to me. Uh, he says, comparing your chronology with that of your parents, you will come across milestones and detour markers that you scarcely noticed before. And when I read that, that really kind of blew my mind as I started to think about my parents versus me. And so, for example, my dad was about 32 and when he decided to leave uh, his parents' religion of Roman Catholic and converted to Jehovah's Witnesses. And then here I was, again, about 32 years old, deciding to leave my parents' religion of Jehovah's Witnesses and move on from that. And so the parallels were really striking. Um, and even I could take it to a second level of parallel, which is that when my dad did that, um, his mom started shunning him and shunned him for several years, I think, before they kind of reconciled again. Uh, so that happened when he decided to leave a religion at 32. And then when I decided to leave my parents' religion at 32, it repeated the cycle. And he, uh, basically shunned me for that decision. And I don't know if he's even thought of it in those terms that, Hey, my mom did this to me and did I like it? And now here I am doing it to my own son when he's making the exact same de decision that I did. Uh, so it's just a really interesting parallel. And I mean, you know, trying to justify it kind of leads you into this circular argument of, well, no, it's okay. I'm doing it because I'm in the one true religion. So it, it doesn't hold up super well, but, um, just the idea that that age repeating itself is, is really interesting. And I mean, I guess the one thing I could say, not that I really have any plans to have kids, but, um, if I did, recognizing that cycle is like, oh, okay, well, that cycle stops here, and that wouldn't be anything my uh, kids would have to deal with from me. Now, looking at the Erickson psychosocial stages, um, this stage, which he kind of is kind of like the 30s to 50s um, age range, and he defines the central conflict as generativity versus stagnation, and basically this idea of trying to build something or leave something, kind of leave the world in a little better place than how you found it. And so for some people that is um, raising a family and, uh, you know, raising good kids to, to carry on in the world. Um, for others, it may be something with their career or the environment and in some way trying to improve the world and make it better for others. Um, and the, the alternative to that is stagnation. And this, I think, is really a struggle for many Jehovah's Witnesses because that's kind of the whole point is you're supposed to actively disengage from the world at large. And you're basically kind of in a holding pattern just waiting for paradise to get here. Um, and so there is definitely that aspect of stagnation and not really doing much with the world right now to improve it. 
Okay. And then the third uh, major time period that kind of jumps out at me is somewhere around, say, 70 years old, 70, 80 years old. Um, and in Erickson's model, he defines this uh, stage as the conflict of integrity versus despair. And so basically, as a person is looking back at their life and seeing how they spent their time, are they pleased? Are they satisfied with what they've done with their life um, and kind of proud of, of what they did? Or do they look back and find that they have a lot of regrets about what they did or did not do with their life? And again, this is something I think is really a struggle for older Jehovah's Witnesses because, um, I mean, there's a lot of gray hair on the governing body, for sure, a lot of jowls, but fundamentally it is a young person's religion, I think. I think you can tell it was started by an 18-year-old boy who, <laughs> full of hopes and dreams and a, a guy who was just so excited about what he was finding in the Bible. He quit his job and started self-publishing this magazine and and here we are 140 some years later. But really, uh, it's it's one of those things, whatever era you look at of Jehovah's Witnesses, the end is always just a few years away. And certainly anybody can make sacrifices for a few years to when the payoff is going to be so, so big of living forever in paradise. But for witnesses in their 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, I think the model starts to kind of break down for them because now they're not just looking at five years or so. They can look back at the whole sweep of their life, They'll look at decades in the organization, and they're seeing, you know, scores of years that they've just kind of been waiting and things, things have gone unfulfilled so far. Um, and they can feel the, the loss of, uh, you, you know, the health, for example, the health and vigor that they used to have in their younger years. That is gone. Um, it's often a struggle financially for older witnesses um, in their later years. And a lot of times this is directly due to decisions they made based on direction and counsel they got from the society about you know, whether to go to college or not, or um, what kind of jobs to take, um, or, you know, whether to go to Bethel or into circuit work or missionary uh, work. And they can have a lot of big repercussions in later years when things are get, can get really tight financially. Another aspect you can see um, that it's more of a young person's religion is it's really interesting what the society allows to be counted as time on the time slips. And it is essential to uh, report, be reporting time, but only recruiting efforts can be counted as time. Um, and especially this year is really interesting because the door-to-door -door work is pretty much shut down. And so basically we're looking at letter writing um, billions of letters I'm sure have been written, billions of hours spent doing that. And you can really see as you look at the service report, the futility of all that busy work where the numbers actually went down despite all the time invested. Um, so that is what needs to be counted as time. On the other hand, helping older ones in the congregation, that is forbidden to be counted as time by the society. You cannot do that. And so the end result, of course, is that um, helping older ones is only something that's done when it can be fitted in around everything else that you need to do. And I think the end result is that older ones are really devalued in the organization. And ultimately, their their main use at that point is just in recruiting a new young generation of witnesses to kind of carry on. The cycle over again and there's a really brilliant video on the mentally diseased channel that jeremy did where he talks about this the title the important role of elderly jw's and just that's what they're good for is recruiting young me young members to carry on the cycle for me this really comes home uh looking at the case of anthony morris of the governing body uh, I think his life itself is pretty interesting. And also for me, he kind of serves as sort of a proto-witness. I don't know if that's the term, but 
he he's my parents' age, and um, I'm the age of his sons. And he's just, I just know so many witnesses from that era, from that generation. And I think he really represents how a lot of them feel and act and think and believe. Um, He just has a much bigger uh, megaphone with which to express those beliefs, uh, which is not usually a good thing. (laughs) And I know I'm probably the only person in the world who believes this, but I do you know, as I look at the arc of Tony's life, I do see a person whose faith is probably balancing on the edge of a knife. Uh, and I don't say that to reproach him, um, because I, I kind of like it. Um, you know, there's some governing body members as you look at them, there's not too much going on there. It kind of, you just feel like they're just punching the clock until it's uh, time to go to heaven. Um, Tony still has a, some fire in his bones and, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, that re- has resulted in some horrible, terrible things he's said in talks over the years. But it's just so interesting, you know, he became a witness around 20 years old or so, shell-shocked from uh, what he'd said and or, or what he'd seen, what he'd done in Vietnam. And and again, when I say things he did in Vietnam, I'm I'm talking about good things. He was saving lives in the operating room there. But you can do good things and still be scarred by them. Um, and then coming back to the States, he's disillusioned, he's confused. He finds out, hey, it runs into the witnesses. Everything's going to be fixed in 1975 by Jehovah. All those dead kids, the dead soldiers that um, he, Tony couldn't save, they'll be resurrected by Jehovah to paradise. And they'll, they'll be able to live forever happily. And that's a really compelling narrative, and uh, Tony jumped in with both feet, started pioneering, and really went in whole-souled. Um, and you know, 75 came and went, and now here we are, 50 years later, still waiting for that solution, still waiting for those privates to be resurrected by Jehovah. And so, I don't know, you just you can't tell me that Tony and his wife Susan aren't struggling with that conflict of integrity versus despair as they kind of look back over the decades of their life. So yeah, Tony's definitely said a lot of strange and horrible things over the years in his talks. Um, But the mere fact that he makes strong opinionated statements, uh, that doesn't really bother me. Uh, It doesn't bother me. And I, I feel the same way when I'm reading in the, you know, in the XGW subreddit or especially in YouTube comments, there always seems to be comments, a few comments from, you know, mentally in uh, witnesses that really making these passionate or or even offensive defenses of JW doctrine. Um, Whenever I read those, my sense isn't that the person is trying to convince others to their way of thinking. My sense is always that they're trying to convince themselves. And it may well be that the most strident defenders of the truth, quote unquote, are it's kind of a last ditch effort to save their own faith. And it can very well be that the faith will crack open completely shortly afterward. So, I mean, who knows? You know, it's very possible that Tony will become one of those older Bethelites that just fades into a twilight of drinking heavily in the remaining years there at Bethel. Um, I think probably most of us have watched the Howie Rutledge Tran interview with, um, with, uh, Lloyd Evans and it's really good, but, uh, he also did a, a much longer interview on the pale emperor YouTube channel. And in that longer interview, he talks about this culture of day drinking among older Bethelites, um, who are just doing that to make it through each day. Uh, they're at Bethel in their waning years. So that may be what, you know, what Tony has before him. On the other hand, there are certainly many older witnesses in their 70s and 80s that are waking up uh, every month. And so you read that again in in the Reddit comments and whatnot, people writing in, I just woke up, I need to wake up my family, but my parents have been in it for 40, 50 years. And and you see in the responses, people say, hey, don't give up hope. My parents, you know, are 75 years old and they just shared with me 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure about everything anymore. So it's definitely happening. And, you know, it's a it's certainly a terrible experience to become aware of that um, or to lose your faith and, and realize you don't believe everything you'd believed for 40, 50, 60 years. I mean, there's plenty of 20 year olds on the subreddit writing in saying, oh, my goodness, I've wasted so much of my life. How can I ever catch up to everybody else? And they're, they're 20 years old. <laughs> so now you talk about somebody who's 70 years old coming to that same realization. Whoa. And yet, it is so it's terrible, and it can be a beautiful thing. I'll link to, uh, uh, there was a recent um, Mormon Stories interview that I was just listening to this week, and they talked for, you know, 10 minutes or so about the situation of folks coming out of high control groups that have invested 40, 50, 60 years of their life in it, and um, how that can be handled. So it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's so cool to see Rolf Ferruli, for example, publish his book this year. I think probably most of us in America don't really understand the significance exactly of that. Um, we don't have a feel for how uh, Rolf Ferruli's um, position among Jehovah's Witnesses in Norway there. Um, but I think it was a really, really big deal. And I know people get mad that he didn't go full XJW. Um, and again, I I get that, but it also doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. You know, there is a version of Jehovah's Witnesses that could be harmless, or, or, or I guess you say at least no more harmful than any other mainstream Christian religion. Um, I think Lloyd Evans did a video a while back on reforms that witnesses could make to kind of make their religion into that situation. A couple of years back, I was reading through the Golden Age um, magazines, and I tell you what, that like 1919, 1920 era of the Bible students was a really cool era. I mean, you just look at the name of the magazine, the Golden Age is what they thought they were living in. You know, the Great War was over. Um, the Spanish flu pandemic was over. Scientists were doing all kinds of super cool stuff with uh, radios and cars were getting to be a cool thing and airplanes and uh they just had the sense that the the sky's the limit as far as possibilities and that things would just flow right into the thousand year millennium reign of christ and it would be super awesome and witnesses were celebrating christmas and birthdays then and there were no worries about blood transfusions and shunning wasn't a thing. That's definitely probably the main thing that would have to go. No more shunning, disfellowshipping, judicial committees. Um, so there was a time when it was pretty sweet to be a witness, I think. And, um, and so you see in the ex-Mormon community, they talk about mainstream Mormons, but they also talk about progressive Mormons, or I guess you might even say cafeteria Mormons, which are... Mormons who uh, would, would remain Mormon, but they're kind of picking and choosing. They're going to take the good things from Mormonism that they like and then the stuff that they don't like. They just kind of ignore it and just don't do it. And, uh, you know, if there were enough reforms in Jehovah's Witnesses, I think that could be a thing, too, where people believe the good parts of it and just ignore all the bad parts of it. So... And that's kind of where I see Rolf Ferruli right now. So those are kind of the three ages that really jumped out at me, late teens, 30, and maybe, you know, 70 or so, um, where people are uh, joining, people tend to join Jehovah's Witnesses. And so it's kind of like this mirror scenario where the age that people join Jehovah's Witnesses is also the age people leave Jehovah's Witnesses. So every age that Witnesses get excited about, oh, that's a good uh, prospect, uh, that's the same age that people are leaving out the back door. Um, and so for every Ken Cook you have that converts in high school, I mean, there's tons of witnesses, kids, witness teens on the subreddit talking about how to leave Jehovah's Witnesses as soon as they graduate high school. Um, plug for the JW.support website that uh, Paul Grundy has, that second website after JW Facts that's really designed for um, Pimo teens uh, living in JW households, how to get them, how they can get out. 
And the same way at that 30-ish age, you know, my dad joined at 32 and I left at 32. Uh, and the same way in the 70s era, you have an elderly woman witnesses meet door to door who just lost her husband in death and really takes to the religion because of that resurrection hope. And then at the same time, you have Ralph Faruli publishing his book at that age uh, about all his issues with Jehovah's Witnesses, and he gets disfellowship. So there's this mirror scenario, and I think, I, I guess I would say in the pre-internet era, it seemed like things went in favor of Jehovah's Witnesses. So there were more folks coming in at those ages. And now in the internet era, I think it's the balance has shifted. And it's definitely that more people are leaving at each of these ages than are coming in. And probably the service report will kind of continue to reflect that in the coming years and decades. So yeah, that's kind of my take on what's going on in in Jehovah's Witnesses, in Mormonism, in Seventh-day Adventism. It's really interesting. All these religions started by passionate teenagers with really strong beliefs, and now the religion is, is kind of starting to fade a little bit into obsolescence for, you know, in modern human society. So yeah, um, I'd be interested to get your thoughts. Are there certain ages you, you think that uh, Witnesses are joining and leaving, and uh, what's your experience been? All right, well, thanks very much for watching, guys. Take care. Subscribe if you'd like. We'll catch you all in the next one.